Chemical bonds are formed so atoms can achieve a full outer shell of electrons. This makes atoms more stable and therefore less reactive. In the periodic table, the elements of group zero are called the noble gases. That's this column on the right hand side here. These elements have a full outer shell of electrons, which makes them chemically inert. In other words, they are unreactive, and so they are chemically stable. The other atoms in the periodic table react and form chemical bonds until they have the same electronic structure as one of the noble gas elements. There are three different types of strong chemical bonds ionic, covalent and metallic. For ionic bonding, the particles are oppositely charged ions and it occurs in compounds formed when metals are combined with non-metals. For covalent bonding, the particles are atoms which are sharing pairs of electrons and it occurs in most non-metallic elements and in compounds made of non-metals. In metallic bonding, the particles are atoms which share delocalized electrons and this type of bonding occurs in metallic elements and in alloys. In this video, we will be focusing on covalent substances. Covalent substances are formed when atoms share pairs of electrons to fill their outer electron shell and become stable. The shared pair of electrons is a covalent bond, and it's the covalent bond, that shared pair of electrons, that holds the atoms together. And the covalent bonds between atoms are very strong, which means that they are very difficult to break. They, it requires a lot of energy to separate the atoms out from that covalent bond. And the type of atoms that form covalent bonds are non-metals. They bond together by sharing electrons. And this makes sense if you consider the fact that generally non-metals need to gain electrons to fill their outer shell that is usually almost full. And so if two atoms both need to gain electrons, the only way that they could do that is by sharing electrons because they couldn't transfer electrons between one and the other and then both have a full outer shell. There are three different types of covalently bonded substances that you need to know about. There are small molecules, sometimes referred to as simple molecules, very large molecules, for instance things called polymers, and also giant covalent structures. The main focus of this video will be small molecules. We will return to the other two in separate videos. Two of the different types of covalent substances are made of molecules, and molecules are formed when two or more atoms are joined together by covalent bonds. And there are eight examples that you need to know about for specific molecules for your GCSE course. Four of them are elements, and that is hydrogen, chlorine, oxygen and nitrogen. And four of them are compounds, and that's a molecule made up of at least two different elements. And the four you need to know are water, hydrogen chloride, methane and ammonia. As well as their name, all molecules can be represented by a molecular formula, and this shows all of the atoms of each type of element that are held together by covalent bonds in the molecule. And you need to be able to recognise the substances that I've listed above from their molecular formula. For instance, hydrogen is H2, chlorine is Cl2, oxygen is O2 and nitrogen is N2. These four elements are all diatomic molecules and di means two and atomic is referring to atoms. So they are molecules made up of two atoms, two hydrogen, two chlorine, two oxygen or two nitrogen. The compounds are more complicated. Water is H2O and that means it is made up of two atoms of hydrogen bonded to one atom of oxygen. Hydrogen chloride is HCl, 
Methane is CH4, meaning one atom of carbon and four atoms of hydrogen, and ammonia is NH3, one atom of nitrogen bonded to three atoms of hydrogen. You can predict the number of covalent bonds an element will form based on its position in the periodic table. And so if we take the first 18 elements of the periodic table, and we need to remember that their vertical columns are called groups, and they are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 0. And then if we remember that the group number is the same as the number of electrons an element has got in its outer shell, sometimes called its valence shell. And so that means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then in group zero, the elements have either got eight electrons in their outer shell, which is most common, or for helium, it has got two electrons in its outer shell. And then we need to consider how many electrons the elements need to gain in order to get a full shell of electrons. Well, hydrogen in group one could have two electrons in its outer shell, and so it needs to gain one extra electron to fill its outer shell. I'm not going to consider the other elements in group one, and I'm going to skip group two altogether, because those are metals and they do not form covalent bonds. Boron is not one of the elements that you need to know anything about for GCSE chemistry, so I'm going to skip group three as well. The elements of group four have got four electrons in their outer shell, and that shell could hold eight electrons. So that means that they need to gain another four electrons. And then group five has got five in their outer shell, so they need to gain another three to make eight. Group six need to gain another two to make eight. Group seven need to gain another one to make eight. And group zero have already got a full outer shell, so they don't need to gain any more electrons. And then the number of covalent bonds an element needs to form is the same as the number of extra electrons they need to gain. So hydrogen will always form one covalent bond. And the other elements will form four if they are in group four, three if they're in group five, two if they're in group six, and one if they are in group seven. As a general rule of thumb, hydrogen forms one covalent bond, and to work out the covalent bonds of another element, it is that element's group number subtracted away from eight. We can use dot and cross diagrams to show the bonding in covalent substances. And the electrons are shown as either dots or crosses, and there's no actual difference between a dot and a cross. It's just used to indicate which atom originally owned the electrons that are part of the bond. For example, for the dot and cross diagram for the element fluorine, you can see that we've got these circles around fluorine, and each of these circles is representing the outer electron shell of a fluorine atom. The fluorine atom on the left is having its electrons shown as dots, and you can see that fluorine is in group seven because it's got seven dots on display, and the fluorine atom that it is being bonded to, its electrons are being shown with crosses, and you can see seven crosses around that fluorine atom. In this area in the middle, that is where we're showing the electron sharing that's taking place in the covalent bond. And so those two electrons in the middle belong to each of those fluorine atoms. So this fluorine atom on the left has got six electrons that are not involved in bonding, and it's got a share of those two electrons in the middle, which gives it eight electrons in total. And the fluorine on the right has got the same thing. It's got the six electrons of its own, not involved in bonding, and it's got a share of those two in the middle. So both of those fluorine atoms have got eight electrons. Now I've shown the dot and the crosses in these positions where the shells overlap and meet, but it is perfectly possible to put them anywhere in this sort of oval shaped overlap region. Often you might put them here and here because then you can keep them on the shell that belongs to the atom that they originally came from. Sometimes dot and cross diagrams don't even actually show the electron shells themselves. So for this second example, for hydrogen sulfide, you could see I've got the sulfur atom in the middle with its six electrons shown as crosses. 
sulfur is in group six, so you'd expect it to have six crosses. And the two hydrogen atoms that it is bonded to, its electrons are being shown as dots. And you can see that I'm not showing the shells, but it is very clear where there is a pair of electrons being sandwiched between two atoms. That is representing the shared pair of electrons. The covalent bond is still obvious and on display here. Not only do dot and cross diagrams show the electrons involved in bonding and those that are being kept out of bonding and being left alone, we can also use dot and cross diagrams to deduce the formula of a molecule. For instance, the fluorine that's shown on the left, we've got two atoms of fluorine. And so the formula for this fluorine molecule would simply be F2. A little two after an element's capital letter shows that we've got multiples of that element. And hydrogen sulfide has got one capital S for sulfur, but it's got two capital H's for hydrogen. And so the molecular formula for hydrogen sulfide would be shown as H2S. We can also represent covalent substances using a displayed formula. And when we draw displayed formulae, we use lines to represent the shared pair of electrons in the covalent bond. And these lines usually look like large minus signs if they're horizontal, or they can look like L's if they are shown vertically. And what they're doing is they're representing the covalent bond, the shared pair of electrons. And so they are equivalent to one dot and one cross sandwiched together from a dot and cross diagram. And displayed formulae show all of the bonds in a molecule. So they don't just show which atoms of each element a molecule contains, it shows how they are bonded together. So for instance, in this molecule of ethane here, you can see that there are two carbon atoms sharing a covalent bond, and each of those two carbon atoms has got three hydrogen atoms coming out from it at each of the compass points. We normally show displayed formulae as up, down, left, right at 90 degree angle angles to each other, but each of those sticks is showing a covalent bond. In an exam, you could be expected to draw the displayed formula for certain substances, but they will be specific ones that you will be told clearly that you need to learn. We can use a displayed formula to work out something's molecular formula as well. That's just a case of counting the atoms of each element as before. And so you can see that this displayed formula has got two atoms of carbon, so we would write C2, and we have got six atoms of hydrogen, so we would write H6. And so the formula would be C2, H6. Remember to keep those numbers in a formula as subscript numbers down on a line and much smaller than the capital letter that we used for the symbol. Ball and stick diagrams or three-dimensional models are the best way of showing how the atoms are arranged in space for a covalent molecule. They can also be used to show how the sizes of the atoms vary relative to each other. In a ball and stick diagram, the atoms are shown as the balls, usually of different colours, and they're normally accompanied by some kind of key. And the sticks are what represents the covalent bonds between the atoms, so that shared pair of electrons. And 3D models are very, very similar. They still show the atoms, they still use different colours, and they still try and give an idea of the space filling for the atoms in a molecule, but they don't show any sticks. And so the atoms end up looking much closer together. In an exam, it's unlikely that you'd be expected to draw one of these, but you certainly could be given a diagram and expected to work out what the molecular formula was for the molecule. And so for this example that I'm using here, you can see that this molecule has got one atom of carbon, that's being shown as the black circle, and it's got four atoms of fluorine. Those are the green circles. And so the molecular formula for the molecule shown here would be CF4 making sure that we use a little four to show the four fluorine atoms in the molecule. Each of the different ways of representing covalent substances have some advantages, but also some limitations. For instance, dot and cross diagrams are great for representing single bonds and double bonds, and they clearly indicate where the electrons came from in order to form that bond. However, what they do not do well is show the relative sizes of the different atoms in the molecule, 
or give any indication as to the spatial arrangement, that means the three-dimensional shape, of that molecule. Displayed formulae are also really good at showing both single bonds and double bonds in a molecule, and they are good for showing the structure of large molecules in a clear way as well. However, like dot and cross diagrams, they don't show the three-dimensional structure of a molecule, and neither do they show the electron ownership of the pair of electrons in the covalent bond, and they don't show electrons in outer shells that are present but are not involved in bonding. Ball and stick diagrams and three-dimensional models are the best way of showing the three-dimensional shape for a molecule. However, as molecules get larger, the diagrams can appear confusing and they don't show anything to do with the electrons at all. And so we don't see electrons not involved in bonding and we don't see the electron ownership in the covalent bond itself.